Hi, and welcome to today's video. Today we're going to be looking at cylindrical grinding. And well, before we get into looking at the different parts of a cylindrical grinder, I think it would be good to remind ourselves why grinding is an important operation. There are three reasons, or three main reasons, that justify grinding a part. Now, grinding is an expensive operation. So, if it can be avoided, well, it is avoided. We only do it when we have to. Then the three reasons are surface finish, precision, and material hardness. So, let's look at them in order. And really, surface finish and precision kind of go together. It's good to remind ourselves that grinding is a cutting operation. It is abrasive machining, but it's not rubbing machining. The uh, abrasive wheel or the grinding wheel has cutting lips, which are the abrasive grains. And they are very sharp. And each grain that comes in contact with the part will lift a very small chip. Now, surface finish really is uh, a reflection of the smallest chip that you can produce. And precision is as well. So the smaller the chip, the better the surface finish. Now, with grinding on most surface or cylindrical grinders, uh, it's not too difficult to lift a chip off of a part with a thickness of only about maybe one ten thousandth of an inch. And that means that I can get a very good surface finish on the part. And if I can cut a chip that's only one ten thousandth of an inch thick, well that means that I can cut pretty accurately. As long as the machine is rigid and accurate as well. And well, why is it that we can lift such a small chip? Two reasons. We've already mentioned that the abrasive grains in a grinding wheel are incredibly sharp. So the sharper the tool, the smaller or the thinner the chip that it can lift. But tools that get very thin on their points or very sharp tend to melt easily. And that's a problem with lathe high-speed steel tools or even milling tools. The abrasive, however, is very resistant to heat. So it will remain sharp even if we're cutting very thin uh, chips at a high rate of speed. Now, the chips that the grinding wheels produce are nice orange or white, whitish orange color. That means that they're very hot. And why is that important? Well, the hotter the chip that we lift, and remember the heat stays constant. We've seen this in our uh, chip speeds and feeds videos, the two, both of them, but we'll just remind ourselves here that if you lift a chip that's very hot, well, it becomes very malleable. And since the heat will concentrate in the chip and not on the part, unless we're rubbing, if we're cutting, the chip will bring most of that heat with it. Well, that means that it's a lot easier to lift a chip that is a bright orange than it is uh, if you're lifting a chip at a lower temperature. And we can get away with that because the abrasive is very sharp and very heat resistant. And that is also why when we cut with abrasive wheels, we have to cut at a very high rate of speed. We're talking of 1,000 around a surface feet per minute uh, or more, uh, depending on what we're cutting. And remember, if you're cutting with a very small wheel, it has to turn a lot faster than a very large wheel to get the same surface speed on the outside diameter of that grinding wheel. Now, for a part to be accurate, well, it has to have a good surface finish. I mean, a part that has a rough surface finish cannot be accurate. However, a part can have a very good surface finish without the need for being very accurate. And in that case, well, we'll 
prefer polishing or buffing operations to grinding. So avoid soft parts. Remember, they aren't stable. They're easily scratched. They're easily dented. They're easily deformed or really worn. So precision parts are usually hardened parts. So let's take a look at the different parts of this universal cylindrical grinder. Now why is this called the universal cylindrical grinder? Well, because there is a double table on it. The lower or bottom portion of the table slides on the ways and is fixed. In, in other words, it cannot be adjusted. It's very accurately in line with the machine. Whereas the top table can pivot on the bottom table and that makes possible all kinds of very accurate tapers but it also makes it possible to adjust this machine so that I get a very very parallel part. So let's take a look at the different parts of this machine. Now these machines are a little bit and I mean a little bit like a lathe and because we have tailstock and we have a headstock and well that is where the similarities end because everything else is pretty different our cross slide well is it really a cross slide it doesn't ride on the ways these aren't ways these this is a table it is the top table that pivots on the bottom table and now the bottom table at its base has Way, contacts the ways on the base of the machine. So there are ways, but we can't see them here. And what would seem to be a cross slide, this part here, is sort of like a tool holder, but it's not a cross slide because it's on a separate part. It's not connected to the table. Now, that is quite different. And also, a main, main difference, because oftentimes people say, well, grinding, cylindrical grinders, lays, it's just basically the same thing. Not true. The table here moves lengthwise here in a reciprocating fashion and that means that the headstock and the tailstock moves with it. All of this goes back and forth. The tool here is fixed in its position lengthwise but it can plunge back and forward into the part. So we can see that it is very different. Now, why is it that way? What we want here is an extreme precision. And for that, we want long and very accurate ways on the base of the machine. Now, if I have the whole table riding on the whole base, well, that is a huge contact, and that is very, very accurate. And that is why it's set up in this way. Now, as far as the table moving, well, that permits all kinds of different operations that we wouldn't easily be able to do on the lathe. And most of them have to do with either cutting very parallel or purposely cutting a taper. The tailstock can be slid back and forth along the table. It can be locked. And, as you can see, the center here is spring-loaded. And this ensures a constant pressure when I move parts or when I change from one to the other when I'm doing a production run. Now, note that there is no provision here for drilling. These tailstocks aren't made for drilling. They're really just made for support. The headstock can also be slid back and forth along the table. And we see that it can either incorporate a chuck, three or four jaw or whatnot, or a live center, uh, one or the other, depending whether we're in a chucking operation or a turning between center or grinding between center operation. Now, the headstock and this is important, can be slid back and forth. But, as you can see the graduated scale down here, it can also be pivoted. And we'll see that that's important for certain type, types of uh, 
taper the grinding. The grinding wheel head sits on ways that are perpendicular, so it can move back and forth here, perpendicular to the ways of the table. And they're completely independent one from the other. Now, this abrasive wheel head also can be pivoted 360, but in reality it's 180 degrees max, uh, to, again, adjust the abrasive wheel, or more often than not, to adjust it to turn certain types of tapers. Now, that's one reason why we want to pivot, but there is another, and that is that there's not one abrasive wheel or grinding wheel on this machine, there's two. And the other one, well, is in back here. And it's the grinding wheel, much smaller, for internal grinding. So on this universal machine, we can do external or internal grinding. At the front of the machine here, we have our longitudinal hand wheel with its micro adjustment. And we have our cross feed hand wheel with its micro adjustment. So this is for the manual movement of the table and the working head. So with this, we have this feed or longitudinal axis reverse switch. And this is because the table moves hydraulically when activated at a certain speed. This will move back and forth depending on which stop it hits to reciprocate the table movement. Now, that coolant flow is quite important, especially when we're grinding long, thin parts. When you start to grind a part, well, it's always going to touch on one side more than the other in the beginning. But the problem with that when you're cylindrical grinding is that the side that you touch is going to get hotter than the side that you don't touch. And that means expansion, and that means warping, which means that the side that you've touched first is going to touch even more in the next pass because the bar that you're grinding is going to flex in that direction. Now, that's problematic, and that is why it is so important to use your coolant when you're cylindrical grinding, especially on long, thin parts held between centers. ZZ Top used to say that women go crazy for a sharp dressed man. I don't know if that's true, but I do know that if you want to grind accurately and get a good surface finish, you're going to need a well dressed and sharp grinding wheel. So we're going to use our diamond dresser mounted on the table and the longitudinal feed to cut the wheel in a way that will sharpen it. In other words, we want to expose nice, new, and sharp abrasive grains and true up the wheel. In other words, we want a wheel that is true to its axis of rotation and that has a face that is parallel to the longitudinal axis of the table. Now, there's two ways of holding your part in these machines. And we sort of done them to death with the lathe videos. And well, the first way to hold here is chucking. And that's when you use a three jaw, a four jaw, a six jaw, or a collet chuck to hold the part by only one end with no support on the other side. It's a chucking operation. And well, the second way of holding your part is between centers, either with a drive dog or a self-driving center. And, well, on the other end, you have your support center. Now, these centers, these are very accurate machines. We don't want any movement between centers, actually. So, we'll have here a solid center in the tailstock. It won't turn with the part. 
And that means that it has to be lubrified. It's important that it is. So make sure that you use an appropriate grease, a high pressure grease, uh, to uh, lubrify that center so that you don't melt it off or damage your part. Also, important to remember, there's a lot of abrasive dust going on around here and it could get into that grease. So clean it very well before you replace the part and put a new dab of grease in your center hole. So, let's take a look at a chucking cut here. And we're going to notice we had two ways of holding the part and there's two ways of cutting with these machines. There's a plunge cut and there's a progressive longitudinal or a feed cut. The plunge cut is when the uh, abrasive wheel here is going to plunge directly into the part using the axis of the work head, uh, the, the, the uh, grinding wheel work head. The second is when we use the longitudinal axis to feed the, the grinding wheel into the part and cut it progressively. Both have advantages, both have disadvantages. And now let's take a second plunge cut to create a second concentric diameter. Now, this isn't important. I mean, this isn't a real part. It's just a test piece. But hey, it's fun to watch. And, well, there you go. Another useless part brought to you by that lazy machinist. So, here we are with a representation of a cylindrical grinder seen as if we were a little bird flying above it. We have our headstock, our tailstock, we have our work wheel, or the working head for the grinding wheel, and we have our upper table in orange, and our lower table in green. And as mentioned, most of these parts can be offset. I mean, the grinding wheel can be offset, the work head can be offset, and if we're going to offset the work head, we'll probably be using a chuck for that. And, well, the top table can be offset in relation to the lower table. So there's a lot to talk about here. I want to talk a little more about plunge grinding and progressive cuts because we haven't talked about tool wear, in this case, grinding wheel wear. And I would also like to talk about, it's great to offset, but how do we line all this up? How do we realign things once it's done, or how do we offset it accurately? So there's a lot to look at still. And we'll be doing that in the part two of this video. So until we meet again, have fun, be safe, and happy machining.